The Source of Sustenance Two beggars, each of whose need was very great, sat one day at the foot of a castle wall. One of them cried out, I beg that the king who lives in this castle may give me a bowl of gruel. The second beggar took up the cry, but he said, I pray that the king and the lord who is over the king may give me something. Now the king heard the supplications of the two, and he said to himself, I, the king, shall answer the man who invokes my name alone. Let the Lord who is called upon look after his own. So he called for a large bowl of gruel, dropped a gold piece into it as an afterthought, and sent it down to the first beggar. It was a very large bowl, and in spite of his hunger, the first beggar could not finish what it contained. When he had eaten all he could, he stood up and went on his way, leaving the bowl on the ground. The second beggar, seeing that there was still some food left, took it up and started to eat. When he got to the bottom, he found, of course, the gold piece. In this way, the first beggar got what was to be had from man, the second what was sent for him, and the king, who had watched what had happened from his turret, began to see the results of intentions in a new way. There is a couplet written by the Sufi sage Shah Abdul Haq of Delhi, author of the Futu al Khayyib, Revelation of the Hidden, which may be applied to the experiences of each one of the three men in the story. After seeking, you shall find but you shall not find in the seeking. The Powerful Effect of Rituals I cannot understand why, if so many rituals are not spiritual in content, they have such a powerful effect upon me. If you could see yourself from outside, let alone from inside, you would not have that problem, of course. All that can be done for you until you can accept the guidance of wisdom is to tell you about the man who was fond of getting married, or at least that was what people concluded, since he married and divorced sixteen times before it was discovered that he was addicted to wedding cake. Stupid and Important Ideas I've been unable to understand why so many people are more attracted to useless things than to real ones. They will follow the stupidest ideas, yet fail to take heed of important ones. Put out a piece of fresh meat and also a piece of rotten, and see which attracts more flies. But that is to call well-intentioned people lovers of carrion. There is nothing objectionable about that from the point of view of the carrion eaters, and we must be able to see their point of view. Loss of Joy I used to get such satisfaction, such joy from liturgy. Now I feel nothing. I wonder whether this can be because I am less spiritual. It is more likely to be for the reason that the match in the joke did not light. What match? First man. This match won't light. Second man. Strange. It did last night. As Sadi puts it in his Bostan, do not burn the rose bush in the autumn, for you will see its blossoms in the spring. My False Self I have heard much of the need to struggle with the nafs, the false self, which we take to be our real self. But the more I struggle, the more I find that it is too strong for me. What do I need to do? You have to know that the first problem is one of definition. 
Someone needs to show you what your real problem is. Uh, we may say to a deaf man, you are hard of hearing. You will have to make your ears clear so that they may hear. He will thereupon think that he has wax in his ears. Then he may try to save up for a hearing aid. His problem, however, may have been that he needs a haircut. Organisations Why do you need organisations to provide Sufi studies? If Sufism can be studied through many avenues, some of which do not look like spiritual entities at all. We do not need organisations at all. You, however, do need organisations. The reason is that these legitimate ones protect you against the hordes of pretenders who set themselves up all over the world, claiming to belong to orders, to inherit teachership, to interpret the literature. Just as with non-spiritual affairs, people in this field have found it necessary to form societies to protect the public against charlatans. In, for instance, law, medicine, education, commerce and so on, so equally is it important in the area of Sufi studies. But this is necessary only because so many would-be Sufis are unable to distinguish between the true and the false. If people cannot tell one from another, how are the ignorant protected against false organisations by the existence of real ones? First, if you are sufficiently sincere and observant, you will not be taken in by the false ones. The people who cannot distinguish are usually those who have been indoctrinated by shallow spiritual people who permit hypocrisy. The real organisation exists to find an echo in the hearts of the real people. Second, the true organisation covers much more ground and can, by its very existence, destabilise spurious organisations and infuriate shallow individuals. The latter, you see, always confine themselves to indoctrination or narrow dogmas, like claiming that Sufism is found only in orders, in music or romantic poetry, in certain books and not others, and so on. The real Sufis, on the other hand, can show the Sufi content in such a wide range that the cults cannot compete. But this principle has to be established in the minds of the public, and this takes time, as it is a new concept to many people. Some do not like it at all, as they are cult-minded without knowing it. Humour and Sufi Understanding German tourists are to be found all over the world. One day, two of them were talking together in a remote part of Africa when a British soldier broke cover from the jungle, shouting, Halt! Who goes there? The war is over, my friend, said one of the Germans. You mean to say that your damn Boers won it? said the Tommy. Whatever does Queen Victoria think? Very similar is the situation of the Eastern and Western followers of outdated mystical and spiritual systems. Because they lack information as to the transitory nature of local presentations, for instance, dervish dancing or reciting mantrams, they follow ideas and practices which are not only unfruitful, they cause them to misinterpret the truth when they do come across it. Hence the importance of the understanding of supersession. Equally important is to know that the Sufi may have to get people to do things for their own good, which they would never do by themselves, because they want what they think is right, not what will actually be right for them. A Sufi once visited a monastery full of lazy and ignorant monks who disliked him and would not listen to his exhortations, because he said that before being able to learn, people must put in certain efforts which prepare them for learning. When he left, they found that he had left behind a piece of paper which appeared to be a map of treasure buried on their land. They dug up the whole of their grounds, but found nothing. Furious, they sent a message to the Sufi, asking him why he had hoaxed them. His answer ran... Now the land has been dug, you can plant crops. 
These will keep you for the year which it will take you to reflect on whether or not you want to learn and where you can find the teaching you need. The importance of seeking for teaching in the right places is seen in the usage or misusing of literature and practices which do not have the meaning which is ascribed to them by the ignorant. We often find people carrying out processes and following theories which emanate, true enough, from legitimate sources, but which are wrongly understood. Sometimes, far from giving advantages to the people involved, they are signs of danger. Transpose this into a modern setting and you will see what I mean. A pilot with a novice in his aircraft was surprised to hear him chanting prayers through the intercom. "'What are you up to? Are you frightened?' he asked. "'On the contrary, I was giving thanks,' was the answer. "'You see, as we passed over that cathedral, both engines fell off, "'no doubt attracted by the sanctity of the place. "'I take this as a good omen, and I am not frightened any more.' "'This is not unlike the tale of the deep-sea diver, "'who, in his pressurised suit, saw an oriental guru at a hundred fathoms, bobbing about, stark naked. Amazed, he wrote on his underwater message pad, What are you doing, great master, without a suit at this depth? The other man snatched the writing instrument and wrote, Drowning, you fool! Even understanding straightforward instructions is hard for people who think literally in one way, but not literally enough in others. The only way to encourage them to harmonise with what is useful to them is to carry out extensive preparatory work. This joke is a good example of how things look to the Sufi when he is giving instructions to people who are not attending carefully enough. A Sufi was approached by a man who wanted to talk to him, although a large number of other people were already waiting patiently. He said, Please go to the end of the line and wait. The man left the room. When the Sufi saw him later, he had enrolled with a false but exciting teacher. Why did you not do what I said? asked the Sufi. You said go to the end of the line, but there was someone there already, said the man. So I realised that if you did not know that, you would be no use to me. Sectarianism. One way that you can tell whether a supposed Sufi or Dervish group is genuine or just an imitation is when they have sectarian prejudices. Some of these are really miniature churches. Examples are the Bektashi order, which is mostly resolutely Shia, followers of Ali in Islam, and the Mevlevi, dancing Dervishes, who are adamantly Sunni. Traditionalists. The Sufis who follow the real path are not troubled by any such considerations, as the classical literature shows. There is a story which is popular among the legitimate dervishes which relates to this. It is said that a true dervish once went to Iraq, where there are both Sunnis and Shias. Walking along one street, he was accosted by a shopkeeper who said, Are you a Sunni or a Shia? I'm a Sunni, said the dervish, and he was immediately beaten up. The following day, he was in the marketplace when a number of men approached him and demanded, Sunni or Shia? This time, he thought that he would be more careful. Shia, he said, and found himself with two black eyes. He quitted the country as fast as he could, and when he reached the border with Syria, the immigration officer asked, "'What is your reason for wanting to enter this country?' "'Well,' said the dervish, "'they're all unbelievers in Baghdad. Whatever your beliefs, they thump you.'" Brain Power There are four important dervish orders recognised in the East. The Kadiri... Surawadi, Chishti, and Naqshbandi. Of these, the fourth way is in fact regarded as the original one. 
for the reason that it alone adapts to circumstances, while the others rely on repetition of formulae and the use of ritualistic regalia. The ever-increasing sterility of the three ways is a matter of such obvious experience that many stories are told about the simplistic behaviour of the peers and murshids of these groups, their ancients and directors. One such is the tale of the Nakshbandi Sufi who arrived in India, where some of the worst excesses of these degenerated cults are to be found, and found that most of the people in his area were chishtis. He was talking about this to a doctor who said, Oh, that's easy. I'll remove half your brain and you'll be indistinguishable from a chishti. When the time came for the operation, the surgeon cut too deep and took out three quarters of the Sufi's brain. When he recovered, he started to shout, I am an illuminated Kadiri. He started to abuse the doctor, saying, I wanted to be a chishti and you have made me a Kadiri. I admit a mistake, said the surgeon, but things are not exactly as you see them. You see, when chishtis are coming round from anaesthetics, they generally claim to be kadiris, if they have really been turned into surawadis. Some of the letters which we receive from opponents or would-be disciples are so confused and absurd that they have to be rewritten before they can be understood well enough to say that they are useless. Obtuse As anyone who has read a letter from one, or seen how he deals with problems, will readily agree, pretended Sufis are far more obtuse than the general population. A popular anecdote related in the East by those who are not under the spell of such pretenders' harangues gives a fairly close analogy. There was once an epidemic of bullying at a school run by a reputed Sufi. He called all the boys together and said, Forgiveness is enjoined upon us by our holy law. Let those who are bullies put up their hands. Only three boys failed to respond. The Sufi called these boys up. "'Have you anything to say before I have you whipped for failing to confess?' he thundered. "'Reverend sir,' answered one of the boys, "'we are the ones who were bullied.' Heaven Two ways in which you can tell deluded would-be Sufis is that they want attention and are always telling other people what to do. There was one such, the story goes, who died and presented himself at the gates of heaven. The two angels on guard there said, I am sorry, but we do not take in the self-deluded. That's all right, fellows, said the self-styled Sufi teacher. You can relax. I'm taking over the place now. Dervishes. Real Sufis love jokes, and pretended ones fear and hate them, calling them superficial and irreverent. This one is often told to pretended Sufis to see whether they will enjoy it or not. At one and the same time, it illustrates one of the major defects of self-imagined Sufis, selective study. There was once a man who believed himself to be a dervish, and, in the way of all such people, he took from the literature and practices only those parts which appealed to him, leaving out some of the most important portions, and unaware that studies are prescribed, not imitated. Now, in his town, there happened to be a butcher's shop whose owner had been ordered on pain of death to provide the king with one thousand calves' livers for dinner. The butcher came to the man of truth and asked for his advice. Noble sir, he said, I have no time to kill and cut open the calves and get the livers ready as well, and I shall die unless I can deliver. No problem at all, my brother, intoned the all-wise one, drawing on his experience in copying Sufi teachings. 
Simply take out the livers today and slaughter the animals tomorrow. Cut off from the mainstream of Sufi knowledge, many alleged teachers of the way in parts of India and Pakistan cater for a large clientele, often as ignorant as themselves. One Westerner who came across a settlement of such divines in a part of India once famous for its Sufis was asked by them where he had been. Well, uh, I've been in Japan. Uh, And what is that? Where can it be? Uh, It's a country many thousands of miles from here. Thousands of miles? By all that is holy, it must be a real dump. It is related that the great teachers Junaid, Bayazid, and Muhasibi had been on a journey to earth and were returning to take their place in heaven. The keeper of the gate called out, Who are you? They told him, You must identify yourselves. So Junaid projected his Baraka, spiritual force, upon the angels and told them what they were thinking. Pass within, great saint. Then Bayazid showed the angels everything that was happening upon the earth. Pass, great saint. It so happened that there was waiting just behind one of the myriad fanatics who claimed to be Sufis and who had just died. You cannot come in until you identify yourself, he was told. But how can I do that? By performing a miracle, just like the other great ones? The false saint concentrated his mind as hard as he could, trying to project all of himself upon the place and the angels. Suddenly, the gates were transformed into the gates of hell and the angels into the appearance of demons. Enter, great one! they cried. A man once went to see a Sufi, who took no notice of him. Then he journeyed to the home of another, and another, with the same result. Each one of the contemplatives was too deeply in contemplation to find time to see him. Finally, overcome by rage and annoyance at being so neglected, the would-be disciple found himself at a meeting of the three sages and their followers. "'I hate Sufis!' he roared. "'Never mind,' whispered the most ancient contemplative. "'We have spent the past fifteen years entirely working on a cure for that.' A certain man who had been working at being a Sufi for many years, reading books and repeating things to himself, at length discovered that he was not a Sufi at all, only a worldling with pretensions. He rushed into the room where his disciples were doing their prescribed exercises and told them. "'I am afraid that the news is too late,' said his chief follower. "'For fifty of us have already been illuminated through your example.' India is full of self-proclaimed Sufis who often specialise in demanding complete obedience and try their hardest to recruit only docile disciples. One such was approached by an American who said to him in the course of conversation, My grandfather is very rich, but he is lame and blind and cannot continue to run his business. Let him, intoned the supposed sage, sell his property and give it to the order. Just a minute, sage said the American. I said he was lame and blind, not insane. Pretended Sufis are often discernible because they try to convince people that they are the very best at something, achievements of the most bizarre kind, especially in Western terms, are frequently described to amazed and admiring disciples. One of these gentlemen, so the story goes, overheard a foreign disciple saying that report had it that Jesus was a dwarf. 
"'But I,' said the reverend one, "'am the greatest dwarf in history.' "'Peer and Murshid, ancient and guide,' stammered the disciple. "'You do not look like a dwarf to me.' "'Ah, my child, that is because we Sufi dwarfs are the biggest in the world.'